you know it's interesting because when I was when I was a young Christian I used to be so afraid of spiritual warfare I used to be afraid of the devil like you don't want to chokoza him in case he comes and uh, you know he's like to a shimian and let is he who's in me and he who's in the world and spiritual warfare is not dramatic it's just an encounter of the word the word has power to drive out demons and so even that's why even as I teach they, like I said there will be healing today and even deliverance because of that and so we bless God for that a lot of people have run away from me Simbuja Karibu please why are you so far come 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 and by the way if you are at the back those of you who are at the back why are you so far come come close I need a few more people on stage I, I need I need the holy this holy corner needs to come 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 yeah just come don't be afraid come 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 close I have blessings <laughs> wow amen amen I have 10 disciples. I need a 12, but I have 10 at least. <laughs> yeah. Where is Pastor Kuria? Pastor Kuria, each of these is going to see you to give you their size. I want them to get a fearless t-shirt. <laughs> they are my people. They, are, they have come to encourage me. Surely, even me, I must encourage them. Silio. <laughs> amen. Amen. My choir. My deacons. <laughs> Amen. I want to talk about steps to the anointing. Steps to the anointing. Yeah? Steps to the anointing. Are anybody who's joining us now our first time? Karibu sana. The theme of our, of our weekend is catch the anointing. Catch the anointing. <laughs> no, don't catch feelings. Catch the anointing. <laughs> don't catch your friends. Catch the anointing. And I want to talk about steps to the anointing steps to the anointing just remind your your neighbor what anointing is just tell them tell them in case they have forgotten you know some people had tea <laughs> it displaced what they had learned earlier yeah what's anointing it is the power of the holy spirit that helps you fulfill your God-given assignment. Yeah, it's specific power for your God-given assignment. When you choose to pursue an anointed life, there are several steps that you will need to take. There are several steps you'll need to take. By the way, I, this, most of the stuff I'm going to teach this weekend, I learned from Bishop Doug Howard Mills. And again, like I say, there are few people teaching about movements. And so I've processed, I've listened, I've done all I can to just immerse myself, to understand what he's teaching. And then to my surprise, I found it's actually taught by many, many movement leaders. Um, it's just that he writes it and makes it clear. So I just don't want to take credit for the fact that I'm also learning from somebody. I'm also learning from others. Amen? So when you go teach your people, tell them, I learned from Pastor M. <laughs> don't... <laughs> Yeah, there are steps. And those steps that you take, they are, in a way, they act as filters. They act as filters. Why do I call them filters? Because some of them become barriers. And for some people, when they meet the barriers, they give up. And so they miss out on their anointing. There are many who aspire, but few who, who attain. If you remember in Jesus' time, there were many people who wanted to be around him. But Jesus had a way of filtering. He didn't tell people, it's like he, he would tell a parable. Guys have come for bread, by the way. Then they've not even come to here. They've come because they had those bread yesterday and the bread was very tasty, you know. And, and so they show up. They want miracles. And Jesus teaches them in a parable. And then they walk away when they're done. And then he, the disciples come and ask him, so we didn't understand. What was that? And then the disciples, Jesus would explain to them plainly. And then they'd say, so why is it that you don't teach people like this? So you just tell them what you've told us. And Jesus is like, this is not for everybody. Yeah, it's not for everybody. And he's like, you need to understand. 
that there are some people who are not going to get this. And so he would pull up, and those who really wanted to hear, they'd get deeper. It's like he created some filters because he knew there are some people who are not really here to hear. They have their own agendas. And so he created the filter so that those who really needed to hear it would hear. To him who has much, much more will be given. Remember that parable? Jesus himself said that. So it's possible to be a born-again Christian, to live a really comfortable Christian life where your best achievements in your Christian life are memories. It's very possible to be a very, very, people call you a very solid Christian. But if they ask you about your Christian life, your best Christian life is your memories. When we were in high school, see you. And we used to go for missions. And we preached. And we went all over every county. And that's your best. As in you plateaued a long time ago. But people see you in church. You know the scripture. You know the verses. And you're very impressive as a Christian. And so it's possible for that to happen. We need to move beyond. We need to move beyond. The devil, by the way, is very happy with plateaued Christians. Remember, we talked about backsliding last time. We said, if you're not moving forward, you're backsliding. Sometimes we think of a backslidden Christian as a person who used to be in church, now he's in the club. And we don't realize there are many backslidden Christians in church who have just settled. They're not growing in their faith. Because of that, they're stagnating slowly. In fact, one of the songs is called Backsliders Anthem. It's actually one of my favorite. I, I'm, I'm just giving you a hint. Such a cool song. <laughs> so I want to share with you steps to the anointing. And I want to warn you that none of these steps is easy. Is that okay? Can I give you the small print? None of these steps is easy. Um, that's why I said you have to aspire. You have to want it. J- John chapter 12 verse 24. Jesus told, he told his disciples the same thing. He told them, unless a, seed or a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, you're still in, guys, if you, want, if you want to be fruitful, you have to be willing to die. There are actually some barriers you have to be willing to overcome for you to become everything God wants you to be. The first one, the first step is vessel change. Vessel change. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, it talks about vessels. And it says, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes, some for common use. So think about this picture. It's in, a, it's in a kitchen. There are utensils. There are mugs for drinking tea and coffee because all of them are different, isn't there? are mugs. There are jugs for serving water. There are tea urns for when you have a lot of visitors. There are dispensers when people need to have water. There are, are, are pots for cooking. There's a pan for frying. Every vessel has its own use. And then it says there are some which are special. Isn't it? Did you guys, anyway, maybe some of you didn't grow up like this. Don't worry, those are the distractions I was telling you about. You you didn't grow up like this, but in our house, there were some dishes which were not for everyone. I'm sure your house was different from ours. (laughs) There were some dishes which, even for the members of the household, they were never available for us. But when certain, mem- there are some certain visitors you saw, you knew, eh, the plates are not the usual plates. And not all visitors. And not all visitors, by the way. But there are certain visitors when, if you are seen bringing the, re- the usual plates, you'll even be told, eh, where? <laughs> <laughs> and those ones that were in a, ca- in fact, in some houses, they were under a ca- lock and key. In the sitting room, in a, ca- a-, a glass wall unit. Ah, Kumbe, your moms were like my mom. <laughs> These ones you don't touch. These ones are not just for any use. They are for special use. And this is telling us that some vessels in a large house are for special use. The shape of a vessel, the use of the vessel, determines how special it is, isn't it? And and if you desire to be full of God's anointing, you have to be willing for God to mold you into a vessel he can use. Not every vessel is special. The special ones usually cost more. They are made of precious material. They are a little more delicate. When you look at it, you can even tell this one is special. It's not just for anyone. But it also takes a lot more time to make them. For example, to receive Elijah's anointing, John the Baptist could not just be anybody. The guy moved out of his mother's house 
and went to live in the desert and ate locusts and honey. There's a reason why he had to do that. Because this was a lifestyle that taught him how to depend on God alone. Yeah, some of you want to be prophets. <laughs> There's a lifestyle. <laughs> There's a lifestyle. You'll be praying, God, give me prophecy. How come I can't prophesy like other people? There's a cost. There's a thing you need to be willing. There's a, a, a change in the vessel for it to fit that anointing. You know, it's very interesting because some of you desire to be a leader. How many people desire to be a leader, a kingdom leader? Let me just see. Show of hands. Yeah, you want to be a leader. You want to do great things for God. You want to be a great leader. If you desire a, leading, a, a leader's anointing, can I just give you a very basic thing? You want to be a kingdom leader? Leading a discipleship group is not a choice for you. Yeah. Lord, I want to be a leader. I want to be like David. I want to be like Paul. See, you told me you, you want to be like certain people in the scriptures. And then when you ask to lead a DG, you're like, I am not called. Huh? That's not my calling. <laughs> <laughs> How will you lead many if you can't lead a few? Yeah. God may need to grow your gifts of leadership. When you lead those few, you're going to have to learn a few things. You're going to have to learn how to handle pain. People, you call people for a meeting and it's you and your wife. And woe unto you if your wife is not your wife yet. <laughs> or your husband. <laughs> You'll be alone by yourself with your, with your mandazis. Yeah. By the way, is it true? Some of you know what, exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, you have a house full of mandazis. Huh? Guys, are, you're calling guys, nobody's picking up the phone. You send WhatsApp, you're just seeing blue ticks there. <laughs> huh? The apologies are the next day. <laughs> oh, it was yesterday. Ah, I didn't have my phone. <laughs> you know, one of, my, one of my mentors taught me, and he said this, a very powerful truth, and some of you have heard me say this, Leadership is pain management. You cannot be a leader if you're not willing to handle pain. To the degree that you manage pain is the degree that you grow in your leadership. So if you can't handle the disappointment of four people bouncing you, how will you manage the disappointment? How will you manage a church? How will you manage a corporation, a business, a, church, a kingdom business? So that small place will train you in administration, it will train you in compassion. It will train you in prayer. All the vital things that you need as a leader. It will cause you to be desperate for anointing. Yeah. You know some of you right now, it's theory. Anointing. Yeah, yeah, Lord, I, I like anointing. <laughs> but there are some of you who are like, Lord, if you don't give me anointing, I'm going to die. I can't wait. Sunday can't come without anointing. I can't handle another Sunday without anointing. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to give you a hunger. I'm getting personal now. Eh? <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't. If you want to become a leader, you have to start in that space where you're called. That's why for me, every single person in this room is a discipleship group leader. Yeah. If you're not leading one now, you're leading it in the spirit. Just begin to accept it right now. And then go talk to your pastor and say, I'm ready. I will send them. Ah, yeah, so <laughs> your pastor is saying, come. <laughs> yeah. You must be willing to change. If you're not willing to change, you will always talk about being a leader and you'll never be one. You'll read books about it, but you'll never be one. If you desire prophetic anointing and you like being where people are all the time, being in the middle of the party, being where the hang is, the party is, those two things don't go together. Uh, catching up with the latest news and, and what's trending being on social media it's not going to help you you will never be a prophet that way if you want to grow your prophetic gift you have to learn how to spend time with God yeah because at some point it gets confusing who's, who's, which prof, where is that prophecy coming from is it because you're reading news today and you're reading on your Instagram or did you hear God actually download something to you you have to be in that still space, safe. That's, that's why this guy called John the Baptist goes and spends time with God. 
A prophetic call is not a noisy call. It's a place you have to be willing to quiet to be willing to be in a space of quiet to receive from the Holy Spirit. You know, it's very interesting. You also have to be a person who despises lies with all your heart. Uh-uh. You cannot ever be a liar. Even white lies, what they call white lies. I don't know why, why white lies are better. They're all lies. You can't. Because God cannot use a vessel that might confuse his word and put other words in there. There has to be, a, you cannot fail the test of integrity and hope to be a prophet. There's a guy who was called, who was Elisha's prophet, a uh, servant, Gehazi. And Gehazi failed that test miserably. He was supposed to be the prophet's uh, PA, training to become the next prophet. Those days, a servant was somebody who you're training to take over your role. But guess what happens? Somebody comes and says, I want to give a gift to this prophet who has healed me. And the prophet says, no, I don't need your gifts. And as the man is going, the, the servant is thinking, I... <laughs> Amen. <laughs> These were good gifts. This guy doesn't understand how rich this man is. And so he goes and tells the guy, by the way, the guy has changed his mind. He said, I just received this and this and this from you. And then he goes back to Elisha. Elisha says, I was with you when you were receiving those gifts, by the way. My spirit was right there. And tells him, from now on, you will have leprosy in every generation of your family. And that's the end of his prophetic career. Yeah? You can't, if you want to be a prophet, you can't be a person whose people hear you and they're not sure whether you what you're saying. You know, there are those people who, that's why sanguines, by the way, don't end up being prophets most of the time. <laughs> but, by the way, am I lying? Sanguines, we like to add spice. We want the story to, huh? Eh? God doesn't want his message confused. So if you're those people who like adding stories, then just know you're giving up your prophetic calling and anointing. So you have to be willing to change. How many of you desire to be a kingdom financier? Yeah. To manage resources for the kingdom. That's a gift. That's a calling. That's an anointing. Then you must be willing to educate yourself on how wealth works. And specifically, kingdom wealth works. You need to be a listener. You need to be a, a reader. Reading books. Listening to messages. If you're here and you're part of Mavuna and you've not heard all the sermons I've preached about money and listen to them at least twice, then you're joking. You're saying you want to be a kingdom financial, but you don't want to understand how kingdom finances work. You have to also start being radically generous now. Yeah, trust me, if you can't give and help somebody when you have a thousand shillings, you'll never help them when you have a billion. Yes. Kenya has billionaires, by the way, who don't even have a well named after them in their village. We have a very unique scenario in this country where people are wealthy and then they pass on the wealth when they die to their children who don't even know how to manage it. They don't even have a foundation in their name. Nobody's educated, no poor are looked after. Yet the man was so rich. Why? What happened? When he was poor, he was stingy. So when he got rich, he will still be stingy. Yeah, you want to be a kingdom financier? All those hands that went up, I need to see some radical generosity in your life. There need to be some child being supported right now in school. Yeah, you can't just be supporting only your children. Yeah, because God's going to look at you and say, this one, I'm giving them 100,000 and right now only their children are in school. There's not even, even their maid's child is struggling with school fees. How will I give you a million? Yeah, it can't work. So the vessel has to be willing to shift. But how many people know that if you can't tithe with a thousand shillings, you'll never tithe with a million? Yeah. 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 I've, I've had sit-downs with very, very wealthy people. And somebody comes and tells you all the things that Divara is doing in their life. And so let me, let me read the passage that tells you how Divaras are cast out. I say, the Bible says when you tithe, God himself will rebuke. Pastor, pastor has no authority to rebuke Devaras in your life. Malachi 3.10 says, God himself rebukes Devara. And you see the person looking at you like, do you understand what tithing would be like for a person like me? Even the church economy might change. The church cannot handle. <laughs> Lord have mercy. 
You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a guy who took me out for lunch. I was a young pastor, and he's a, he was a wealthy, successful businessman. And he's like, Pastor, I've really been praying. I like your church. I like your church. And I really want to give a significant gift. And, uh, you know, when a pastor hears that, you're like, Pastor, how, CJ, how do you feel when you're told that? Like, where? When? So the guy bought me lunch, and I'm like, dude, my ministry is, is already established. I could see our TV station. I could see, I mean, I was like, it's gone. It, it's happened. And we sat down, we had lunch. Of course, now you're waiting for the end. Eh? Like, okay, tell me, I'm here. I don't like some suspense. So as you're going, the guy writes, takes out a check, he writes on it. He says, hey, he closes with a lot of respect and hands it over to me. Pastor, bless you. And he walks out and I go to my car. You don't even want to look when he's there. You're like, <laughs> when you get to the car, you're like, what? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> He, by the way, I think the lunch was worth more than that check. Eh? I never forget. It was actually I remember what it was. It was sixty thousand shillings. Huh? I remember thinking, I know young people in Mavuno who have given way more than this. Young people who are on their first jobs who've given way more than this for a fast fruit. I know what I knew. What the guys? In fact, it was a public company. It was one of those companies that they even even publish how much the guy makes. So I just remember thinking, my God, it is so hard for a rich man to go into the kingdom of heaven. I even a if that day even said, even camels can enter faster. Yeah. If you don't learn to be a kingdom and uh, 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 financial now, tithing with your hundred shillings, then you'll never tithe. Forget about it. Just forget about it. Forget about being trusted with the wealth of heaven. I told you this step was not easy, isn't it? It tells you why people desire anointing but never get it. Because they're not willing to change. They want to stay who they are, but they want God to fall upon them, to give them power. But you know what? As we sing the song, as we ask God to fall afresh on us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me, fall afresh on me, fall afresh on me. As we're asking God to anoint us, anointing fall on me, we also have to be willing to answer the question, are you willing? What did, John, what did Jesus ask John and, and James? Are you willing to drink this cup? Are you willing to pay the cost for you to become everything that you're asking to be? The second step to the anointing. So the first one is what? Vessel change. Step number two is servanthood. Servanthood. You know, it's very interesting when you read in scripture, anointing was passed in the context of servanthood most of the time. It's so interesting that it's people who served. I, I just mentioned it right now. The servant, when it says the servant of Elijah, usually it was the person who was next in line to receive the prophet's anointing. Those, uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. Now that word aid really is servant. Moses' servant. The person who served Moses. His attendant. Another, minister, another, way, another translation for that word would be attendant or minister. The person who ministered to Moses. 2 Kings 3.11. 2 Kings 3.11. This is when um, the kings were about to go to war. Elijah had died. And the kings are asking, the, the king of Israel is asking a question. Jehoshaphat asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shapat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. So the branding that Elisha has, even though he's a mighty prophet, how do people remember him? The guy who used to serve. He used to wash, pouring water. You think about when Elijah is about to eat, the guy who would come and wash his hands. It's Elisha, the servant of Elisha. If you read uh, First Samuel, Chapter 16, verse 21. It says, David came to Saul, entered his service. Saul liked him very much. And David became one of his armor bearers. The armor bearer was basically the guy who took, he, he basically stood next to the king and served him. Anything the king wanted, he's the guy who went and got it for him. And even in war, he's the guy who stood there and just handed the king his spears and protected the king. So this is a guy, he's a servant, he's Saul's servant. Now, in each of these cases, there was a transfer of anointing 
from the person who was anointed to the person who was serving. The position of servant, by the way, is a humble one. Our, our culture teaches us to be leaders, to be the ones in front, to be the ones who are served. When we think about servant, we think of a person who doesn't have a, their own mind. They're not doing what they think they should do. They're think, doing what somebody else thinks they should do. They're following someone else's vision. They're follow, letting someone else set their agenda for them. It means that your desire is to see the person that you follow succeed. That's what a servant does. And it takes a lot of security to be a servant. Wow. How many people know it takes a lot of security? If you're not a secure person, servanthood will crush you. You have, to, you have to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, you can't serve. Or you will serve with a very rotten attitude. The scriptures tell us that Jesus knew who he was. In fact, it tells us that very clearly. John 13, uh, 3 to 4. John 13, 3 to 4. If you can put that verse. It says, Jesus knew. Do you have it? Let me read it for you. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Stop there. Jesus knew what? All things were under his power. He's like, I've got all the power I need. God has given me power. And then he knew, not just his power, he knew his position, his identity. That I came from God and I'm going to return to God when my time here on earth is done. So it begins with Jesus' knowledge of himself, how Jesus viewed himself. And then the next verse is very radical. It says, knowing all these things, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And if you read the rest of the story, it says he washed his disciples' feet. In those days, everybody's walking. You don't have closed shoes. It's dusty. So when you came into a room, your shoes would be really grimy. And then at the table, you don't sit on chairs. You lie down. So there's going to be a mat and everybody's lying. Now already you can imagine, even in this room where we don't have mud where we're coming from, if we are all to lie down and everybody remove their shoes. Okay, Pastor Grace, relax. We're not going to do it. So we are like, no, Pastor M. I mean, already to be a calamity, isn't it? So what they did is they would have a servant who would, as they're coming in, because your feet are grimy, you can imagine things have stuck on it. It's, maybe you've got some athlete's feet or whatever they call those mud, funguses and all those things as you're walking. Uh, and so the servant's job was to just come and scrub your feet. But in this particular case, it looked like the organizers of the meal, the disciples, forgot to get a servant. And so everybody came and filed in, and they all went and sat, and everybody's looking kind of awkward, like, where is the servant? And he's like, John, I thought you were the guy who's in charge. Where is the caterer? Who, who is the one who's supposed to have? I thought you were the one who was calling the guy. And they all look at each other. <laughs> the guy is not picking his phone. <laughs> and they all look at each other like, dude, I'm older than you. It should be you. Me, I was called. In fact, the Bible says before that they had been arguing about who was the greatest. So maybe that's why they're arguing. It's like, whose job is it to wash our feet, guys? Someone has to do this thing. And it's like, me, I was called as a disciple before you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, in fact, I was Jesus' buddy. I mean, where were you guys when I was calling? In fact, I'm the one who even came and called you. <laughs> that's, that's Andrew telling Peter. Because Peter tells Andrew, you're my younger brother. Then Andrew says, me, I was here before you. So they're having this debate, and the Bible tells us Jesus knows that he has all the power. Wow. He knows where he has come from and where he's going. And on that basis, he stands up, goes to the door, and takes the towel that was left there for a servant and starts to wash their feet. Wow. Isn't that radical? Yeah. Yeah. It takes security to be a servant. Yeah, in the discipleship group, there's a person who likes to serve. And it's very easy to look down on that person or to just think maybe, maybe that's their job, you know? Or maybe for you as the leader to feel it's not my job to serve. Maybe in the, in the new church plant, my job is to preach. Hey. It's your job to be the one to collect the chairs. <laughs> yeah. But the Bible says if you really know who you are, serving does not diminish you. Because you, it, you know, I'm serving you, it doesn't make me less than you when I serve you. That's a scriptural perspective of who you are. Jesus knew who he was and where he was going. He could serve without fear or shame. Listen, you'll never be a great leader if you don't know how to be a servant. I remember being taught that as a young intern by my pastor. 
you will never lead well if you don't learn how to serve well. Wow. And he told us that over and over. He was like, guys, I need you to learn to serve. Let me tell you something, guys. We teach our kids and we taught them. I mean, now they're not kids anymore. But when they were young, one of the things we taught them is how to serve us. Usually parents are like, huh? Because how, what is modern parenting? Modern day parenting is you serve your children. Oh, Johnny, come. Oh, you're not eating that? Oh, daddy. What about you try this? Have you finished? Come, I wash you. Can I wash your dishes for you? It's like, huh? This poor child, they're not being prepared for the world. Because the world isn't going to be asking them, have you eaten? I take your dishes for you. This is why we've got kids coming out of the home and they're completely confused at the response of the world to them. They never learned how to serve. Have you noticed in a classroom, the kids who know how to serve always get the teacher's attention? Yeah, you never taught your child how to succeed in life because servanthood is a way to get ahead. The teacher likes that, that child who is like, oh, in fact, you mentioned we read this. I even brought, I even, you know, it's like, oh, wow. We used to teach our kids, understand your teacher's birthday. Take them a birthday card. Yeah. You know, when a child takes your birthday card, the next one you'll be like, have you understood, Johnny? How can I? <laughs> yeah, they get attention. Because they learned to serve. Yeah. Serving is for you. It's a beautiful thing. But you have to know who you are. You have to be secure in who you are. You know, let me tell you why you need to be a servant. Can I tell you why you need to be a servant? Because anointing can make you proud. Yeah. If you never learned how to serve and anointing comes in your life, you will become proud. I remember once talking to a friend of mine, who, a, a guy I met, and he, he, had a, he had the distinction, he was very jaded about Christians. And when I got to hear his story, he told me he used to pick up preachers. He, he had the job of picking up, he was doing protocol for his church, so he'd be the one to pick up the preachers from the airport and take them to the hotels and take them around. And he said, oh my goodness, the things I saw. It's like people just come out, it's like, oh, okay, here are my bags. And it's like, they go and just sit, chill. And it's like, he just, re- I mean, it's like they treat the people around them like dirt. And then he says, when they step up on stage, they're full of love. And it's like, wow, God's people. And the guy would look and he's like, uh-uh, this Christianity thing is a lie. It's a lie. Yeah. Because somehow these guys got anointing, but nobody ever taught them how to be a servant. Wow. To care for the people that are caring for you. Anointing will keep you from being proud, my friends. And the reason I'm saying this is because some of you, God is about to elevate you to very high levels of authority. Yeah, he will. He'll put you in places where you will not believe. And at that place, if you're not a servant in your heart, if you don't understand that my, this recognition is not what gives me my, my identity. <laughs> Jesus knew whatever honor you give me doesn't shape me. I don't need your honor for me to know that I'm a child of God. I don't need you to give me anything for me to understand that I'm loved. I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. I don't need that. And because of that, I can serve without even expecting a thank you. Yeah. So anointing can make you proud. And God allows servanthood to be the way that you are trained to be a humble leader. Amen? Amen. Can I give you a couple of examples of proud people? First yes. Samuel 15, 30. Saul replied, I've sinned. This is when he's rebuked about doing his own thing instead of what God wants. And instead of falling on his knees and saying, oh my God, forgive me, Lord, I've messed up. What does he say? I've sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and, and before Israel. Come back with me so I may worship the Lord your God. He's like, come on, Samuel, I know I've messed up. I know I've sinned, but right now I need people to see me a certain way. Wow. We can deal with this other stuff later. That's pride. This man was nothing when God elevated him to be the king. But right now, all he was thinking about was himself. Pride comes before fall. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 24 to 25. 2 Chronicles 32. And it says, In those days, Hezekiah became ill. Hezekiah was a king and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. So this is a king who prays. He's a powerful king, by the way, very wealthy, successful, prays. Now he's even a miracle-working king. But the Bible says, but Hezekiah's heart was proud and he did not respond to the kindness shown to him. Therefore, the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and on Jerusalem. Now, here's the danger. His pride caused judgment, not on himself only, but on the people he led. That's the danger. And God many times wants you to learn to be a servant because he understands, my goodness, when I put that 
responsibility and authority on you, I need you to be humble. I remember when I was a young guy going to a conference, this was, it was seared in my mind. I remember going to a conference by a church in our city and there was a guy who was washing the toilets at the break. And, and he looked, I mean, he was wearing an overall, but he had a nice haircut. There was just something about him that told you, okay. So I remember asking the pastor, who's that gentleman uh, who was cleaning the toilets? And he told me he's actually a CEO of a leading company in Nairobi. He told me the name of the company. And he said, we, we were looking for volunteers. Uh, and he signed up to be on the toilet cleaning uh, detail. By the way, have you, ever, have, you ever, have you ever tried in our conferences to have a toilet cleaning detail? We haven't. Do you think people would sign up in Maguno Church? <laughs> Fearless is coming. Maybe that's how, we are, you guys are always saying we don't have the budget. Maybe this is how we get the budget when God's people serve. Yeah. And maybe there are going to be some serious servants of God here, CEOs, huh? pre-qualifying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is humility. Servanthood teaches you to be humble. Number three, third step to the anointing is sonship. Sonship. Amen? Sonship has to do with receiving a spiritual parent. That's what sonship has to do with, huh? You know, it's very interesting because all of us, we're physical families, but God in his mercy puts us in spiritual families. We've learned that before. That God in his love and his mercy for us, he knows we have a spiritual calling. Uh, we're spiritual, we're spirit beings in physical bodies. So he gives us a physical family to look after our physical body. But he also gives us a spiritual family that helps nurture our spirit. And you know, Elijah, Elisha, as we read, he was the son of a man called Shapat. That was who his name was. But when he was with Elijah and Elijah was being taken up, he called out, my father, my father. He understood that this man was his spiritual father. This is where he was going to receive his spiritual inheritance from. You know, it's very interesting. Let me tell you, the thing about fathers, they give inheritance. There's certain things that happen when you have a father. I remember growing up, I had a very amazing father. And as a result, I never ever, and I think I was pretty, pretty entitled, come to think of it, it's interesting, when you have children is when you realize what entitlement is. You don't realize it when you're at home exhibiting it. Huh? But I never ever thought about school fees. I never worried where it was coming from. I never thought, next time am I going to school? Wow. Never. I never thought, are we going to eat today? I mean, it didn't even cross my mind that I'm not supposed to eat. You know, like there wouldn't be food to fill my, to fill my stomach. It just never crossed my mind. Now, I know that that is not the experience of everybody in this room. There are some of you, a father died or a parent went missing or something happened and as a result you grew up in pain and struggle because of that lack of that physical parent. There's a difference that this father makes. And it wasn't God's will by the way because I believe that God's will is that every father will play their role well and every mother will play their role well. So if you grew up in that situation I want to tell you that was not God's will. That was not God's desire. It's not the way it's meant to have been. Physical parents give us a physical inheritance. You know, it, it's interesting. My, my, my dad passed uh, last year in, in August. And it was, an, an, it was, I mean, of course, you can imagine burying your father, not an easy thing. All my cousins showed up. All my friends showed up. Everybody came and gave like 110%. Everybody. <laughs> in fact many times as family members we were served by the people there but you know the interesting thing is when the dust cleared and we're talking about his will and his belongings none of my cousins was in that room none of my friends was in that room because the inheritance is for the sons wow. and the daughters yeah. inheritance is today the reason I'm dressed like this <laughs> a little nicer than I usually dress is because today was actually my, my uncle's funeral. The one who was now my dad's, like the guy who stepped into that space. That's another story. I asked permission for my family to be here. But you know, it's interesting. I mean, we've been there. Since he passed, I've been there every minute. The whole of last week. In fact, even preparing for this gathering was a miracle. Uh, because I was, I mean, 
our generation of my fathers has now, I've realized. It's just I woke up one day and I realized I'm now a muse in the house. And I'm the one people are calling to make decisions. And we're the ones who have to, when, when everybody leaves, they have to be wazes who stay to decide what's going to happen. So now there are no wazes who are staying, it's us. You know? So it's been an incredible, crazy, busy time. And today they're barring him right now as we speak. I bring this up to say, as much as we love, I mean, my uncles, <laughs> I love him with all my heart. Great man. But at the end of the day, I have no inclination, thought, idea, imagination that I'll be in that table when the will is distributed. Because he has children. And those belongings are for his children. Wow. Does that make sense? Yes. Physical fathers, physical parents leave inheritance, or at least they should live inheritance. It's the same thing in the spirit. That in the spirit realm, there are inheritances that are trusted and trusted to spiritual parents for the sake of the spiritual children that God puts in their charge. When a person dies, the inheritance is distributed to children, not to friends or employees. And in the same thing in church or in, or in the spirit realm, there's a spiritual inheritance in every house, in every church. But there, I was always, one thing that always troubles me, or troubled me, doesn't happen nowadays, is when a pastor in Mavuno would introduce me as their boss. This is my boss. I hate that word. I'm like, boss? That's what you see me as. Any, for me, I'm just your salary paying, the guy you, who pays your salary. That's, what, that's our relationship. Really? Don't call me your boss. I'm not your boss. Um, call me anything. Call me your pastor at least. Call me something else. Don't call me a boss. You know, a boss, that's all you get from a boss is a salary. Your wage, the thing you worked for. But sons don't get wages. Sons get inheritance. Yeah, they get an inheritance. I'm going to say something about um, sonship in a bit because I really think it's an important thing for us to understand. Um, it's interesting. There's, there's a bit of a controversy in our city where I remember one of my good friends wrote a, an article says, why you should never call your pastor father. I subsequently did sit down with my friend, by the way, and had a really good conversation. And I said, I think you're missing the point. I think you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think that fatherhood has been abused. But the solution for bad fathers is not no fathers. Because the world's solution for bad fathers Amen. is no fathers. The world's solution for bad men is no men. That's a devil's solution. The solution for, for bad men is not no men, it's good men. The solution for bad fathers is not no fathers, it's good fathers. And I remember we had a really good conversation. And it's interesting because I feel like we reached a place where it's like, okay, I don't think I'd seen that. I think it's very easy for the church to throw away the essence of this message because of the abuse of this message. It's like how people don't talk about money because some, people, some pastors have abused money. So, so now we don't preach about money. For me, I always say, there are people who've preached bad things about heaven, but I'm still going there. Yeah. So there are people who've misused money, but I'll still teach you because money is something it's important. You need to know about it. And you need to, know, you need to understand sonship and spiritual inheritance. It's a very important thing. Number four, I'm going to come back to that, but number four, spiritual impartation. Spiritual impartation. I think it's important to say the same thing I say, and this is my caveat the whole weekend. No human being can give you anointing. Anointing only comes from God. The power to fulfill your mission, the supernatural power we're talking about, only comes from heaven. But here's the thing we've been saying, that God does it through people. Mostly does it through people. Paul laid his hands on Timothy. And when he laid his hands on Timothy, it released a gift, a power to fulfill Timothy's assignment. Before this, Timothy was a believer. And I read you the scriptures earlier. He was a believer. Holy Spirit was present. But something was activated. There's something activated when Paul laid his hands on him. It's in John chapter 20, verse 21, where Jesus does the same. He's been working with his disciples. But in John 20, he tells us, again, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. This is in our, if you've been reading through John, uh, those of us who are reading through the New Testament, right now we're in John. And Jesus says this to them. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And he says, and with that, he breathed on them. He actually did something very symbolic and very powerful. He breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
There's something that he did. And he said, from, that, from now on, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you don't forgive them, their sins are not forgiven. What? what? Remember, Jesus was the one who forgave sins. And everybody was shocked, like, who is this guy? Who does he think he is to forgive sins? He now breathes on them and says, from now on, you have the same power I have. And he doesn't even talk about healing. He talks about the power to forgive sins. He passes this on to his disciples. You know, it's very interesting because this is what God needs to un- us to understand, that there is something called spiritual impartation. I've told you before that when I teach, you can receive this message in different ways. And I have been on the receiving, I mean, I've been on the, when, I, when I'm listening to messages, I usually have, I've had different postures over my life. One of them is I'm here for inspiration. I'm here for inspiration. Inspiration is like I live here feeling good. I'm charged up. I'm excited. Oh my gosh, what a good message. The second thing you could come for is revelation. Where you're like, I'm here to understand some deep things. I'll leave this place with some nice notes and I'll be like, my gosh, I never understood the scriptures the way I've understood it. That would be the win for you. You came for revelation. But I've also come to see that there are other things you can receive from a word if you're ready for it. And one of those is impartation. Impartation means something passes on to you spiritually. There's something that you receive from that word that changes your life and the testimony of that preacher becomes your testimony. Yeah, that's impartation. When I, sp- when I spoke, the Bible says when, I spoke this, when he spoke, the spirit entered into me in Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. He had the word and the word was spoken. He said the spirit entered into me just by hearing that word. And my prayer is for those of you who are here that this will be a weekend of impartation. Amen. 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 By the way, I'm, I'm hoping we'll have some testimonies this week. Yeah, we need to have some testimonies of impartation. There are some of you right now who are living in ways you never imagined you could live. Because of impartation. Because of impartation. And we're going to hear some testimonies. I'm hopefully, we'll try and create some time for that. The fifth one, the fifth step to the anointing, is time and seasons. Time and seasons. You know, time is a very important element to the anointing. God doesn't always give you the, the anointing you need all at once. Because sometimes you're just not ready for it yet. You're, you're not ready for the gift that God has designed you for. And God sometimes will choose to wait for the right time. And sometimes it's you who's not ready. Other times it's your mission that is not ready yet. Yeah? So if you look at the story of Moses, you'll find that he wasn't ready. At 40, he thought he was ready. He was ready for his job. He knew his life work already at 40. It was to deliver these people. So what does he do? He goes and kills an Egyptian. That guy is not ready. (laughs) You've got the right mission, but it's still on you. You're still not humble enough for you to receive this. And God puts him aside for another 40 years. Listen, some of you are on ice right now. You've been on ice for so long. You've just been mark timing. But I want to encourage you that many times when God wants to build a tall building, he he digs a deep foundation. And sometimes it might look like you're just going around in circles. You've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been, uh uh-uh. But God could be preparing you for something so big that takes time. And the reason that you're not ready yet is because maybe you're not yet ready for the size of thing he wants to do through you. But also sometimes it's not your time. And that's what seasons mean. For Moses, it wasn't his time, but it also wasn't the right season. The 400 years of prophecy had not yet ended. So the slavery of God's people would end. And at the right time, when the time came, the man was ready, the mission was ready, and the anointing was released. So there's also sometimes when you just feel, okay, I've been coming for prayer. Pastor Milton has laid hands. Pastor M has laid hands. Pastor Kilonzi has laid hands. I've been going around and been laid. And somehow nothing is yet happening. No, 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 no. That's not what it is. It, It may just not be the season yet to see some of the things you're hoping for. So what you need to do at that point is be faithful with small things. Be faithful in your discipleship group. Be faithful to lead the people and the responsibilities God has given you as you wait for the right time and season. I remember praying those days. I used to watch uh, uh, Pastor Oscar (laughs) with authority. The man would speak and I had the privilege of traveling with him. I watched him speak on some incredibly important stages, big global places where like every, the who's of who is there. And I watched my pastor speak with my, my heart was full of pride because the anointing the man has 
the power he spoke with. And I remember just saying, Lord, I want that anointing. And I remember praying, God, I want authority. The thing I saw in him, the word that I had was authority. I want authority. I want to be able to speak and people take what I'm saying seriously. To hear the power of God in my words. And I remember just like, Lord, I want that. I prayed it for so long. But you know, now I look back and I'm so glad God didn't answer my prayer instantly because I wasn't ready. (laughs) I was not ready. There are some major issues that I had in my life at that point, that had the authority come at that point, it would have quickly become about me. And I think God had to break some things and change some things and move some things and get me to the place where he's like, okay, now you're ready for this part. By the way, I don't even think I have it all at this point. There's still more. I really believe there's more. But I believe that times and seasons, as long as I'm being faithful, the season will come. come so, hey, yeah. You know what? Right now, if God was to ask me <laughs> at the funeral, one of my cousins, who's he's not a believer, he said, all, you, all Christians talk about he's going to a better place, he's going to a better place. But if any of you was to be asked today whether you want to go to the better place now, none of you would agree. <laughs> I looked at him, I told him, dude, talk to me. Me, I'd be ready. I'm the one guy you know, you, you may not know, but me, I'd be ready. You know, I'm not, I'm not afraid of that. Mavuno, (laughs) if all of you came together and did a coup and kicked me out, it's not your portion, I know. (laughs) But you know what I'd do? This thing was given to me by God. Hey, by the way, you know sometimes people say, Pastor M, you're you're talking about fatherhood because you want to be powerful. I'm like, wow, 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 wow. Do you know the responsibility of fatherhood? God. Why would anyone wish this on themselves? Uh, waking up when people are still asleep to pray for their children. Uh-uh. Being a father is hard work. Yeah. But you know, I think God wanted me to get to that place where I don't desire it. I actually don't desire it. My wife can tell you. If I could go home and be a farmer, I'd be very happy. The only thing I desire is God's will. And that's the only thing that keeps me here. It's like, Lord, I will serve you as long as I need to, as long as you call me to serve you. So hey, times and seasons. Tell your neighbor, is this your time? Yeah. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. But there are certain things God wants to do in your life to prepare you to receive his anointing. So I'm going to end this one by just talking about receiving a spiritual parent. Receiving a spiritual parent. How do you receive a spiritual parent? I mentioned sonship. And for some of you, this is either it's new or it's just something you've been struggling with. How do I do? How do I do this? You know? Uh, And here's the thing I need you to understand. Why sonship is so difficult? It's, it's such a critical part of being effective in making disciples of nations. It's indispensable. In the Old Testament, the last verse of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi, where Malachi says, you know what, I want to actually... By the way, could you put that up? I know it's not in my notes, but in the book of Malachi, the last four, two verses, Malachi chapter 4, I think it is, uh, God talks about the fact that he he's going to send the the, the prophet Elijah. And he's actually talking about John the Baptist. And he's saying, I'm going to send this person to come to reconcile the hearts of sons to their fathers and the hearts of fathers to their sons. He says, that's what God, John, the work John is starting is to do that. He says, otherwise I will strike the world with a car. Ah, there it is. He says, this John who's coming, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. God is like, there's a problem on earth. And the biggest problem on this earth is the brokenness of the father-son, mother-daughter relationship. There's a brokenness caused by human rebellion. That's, it started with Adam and Eve in the garden. And God is saying in the last verse of the Old Testament, I'm going to send someone to come and start this job of putting this thing back together. And he says, otherwise... If these hearts are not reconciled, hearts of the children to their parents, I will strike the land with total destruction. Boom. That's the drop mic moment. God goes silent for 400 years. Like that's the end of the Old Testament. It's like the Bible, Old Testament for the Jews ended there. I'm going to send a guy to reconcile sons and daughters, uh, sons and daughters to fathers. And he says, or else there'll be a curse. And then it ends there. I mean, what a crazy place for a Bible to end. He's like, really? That's it? And then for 400 years, no sequel. Season two hasn't started. What is going on? 
And then Matthew chapter 1. Come back to Matthew chapter 1. And I, I, I want to show you something here uh, real quick. In Matthew chapter 1, the scriptures start with a very interesting uh, thing. It starts with a weird part of the scripture that most people don't understand. It's like you're like, it's, the book of Luke is so easy to, because I mean, it starts with a story. Jesus in a manger. It's a nice story. But the book of Matthew doesn't start that way. The first book of the New Testament, it starts with a passage that we tend to run over. Because it talks about, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Look, look at that word. Son of David. Son of Abraham. The thing that was broken. This is a man restoring it. He's a son. That's his identity. And from then on, the whole chapter. Can you go to verse 2? He was the son of who? Abraham. Was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob. And you're just going to read and read and you're like, what does this have to do with anything? But remember, it ended with a fracture. The New Testament brings that fracture back together again. Jesus came to reconcile the hearts of sons to their fathers. So you need to understand, this sonship thing is so, so critical for us. When we don't understand it, we meander in our Christian lives. I want to teach you how to receive a spiritual parent. And the reason I want to teach you this is because many people did not have a good relationship with their physical fathers. If you don't have a good relationship with your father, maybe they were absent, maybe they were abusive, maybe they were just harsh, maybe they just didn't know how to be a father. Guess what happens? Fatherhood is an awkward place for you. I have sons and daughters who, they are very awkward in the father conversation. And I don't blame them. It's because that's just not the way they were brought up. Somehow, people tend to be very comfortable in mother conversations, generally. They are, very, they are tight with their moms. They have stories. But with their fathers, you sit down. Uh-huh. <clears throat> uh-huh. Yeah. You're good? Uh-huh. What else is happening? Uh-huh. All right. It was good to see you. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like they don't have to... There's no, there's no relationship. So you need to learn how to receive a, a father because nobody taught you. Other people, by the way, have very good fathers. So it's not everybody who has a bad father. Some people have very good fathers. So as a result, they almost feel like somebody else taking a role of a father is almost like being disloyal to their earthly father. And I know people who struggle with fatherhood, in the, uh, spiritual fatherhood, because it's like, but I already have a father. Is this like replacing my father? You need to understand that both those scenarios are the way that the enemy will use to keep you from a spiritual inheritance. Yeah. And so I want to teach you how to receive a father. To just, I'll, I'll try and move real quick on this one. Number one, allow them to speak into your life. Allow them to speak freely into your life. So you've got, you've got this spiritual parent. They're somebody who God has put in charge over you. They're your campus pastor. They're your discipleship group leader. They're somebody that God has put in spiritual responsibility over you. How do you begin to receive them? Allow them to speak into your life. Basically, what happens when you receive someone as a spiritual parent, you allow them to speak freely into your life and choose to trust what they say. You know, if you have doubts about someone or are suspicious about them, then the, it will be a major hindrance to you receiving anything from them. It will. Uh, if you have a, a, a major doubts or suspicions or distrust of your earthly father, you might receive money, but you will never receive impartation from that person. There, there are things you will never be able to receive from somebody if you suspect them. And so there has to be a way where you choose to trust. And, I, and, I, and I'll talk about that because many times people feel like trust is earned. You hear people saying, he hasn't earned the trust because we think that trust is earned. But I'll tell you that in the most important relationships, you can't earn trust. The most important relationship I can give you a, point, a pointer to is a relationship when a man and a woman say, I do to one another. When you get married, do you understand you can't untrust? People who do come with stay marriages or trial marriages are trying to untrust. It's like, let's try it and see whether it works. You know why that doesn't work? Because I don't understand the human condition. But until the day you say, I do, you never relax. Do you understand? That's how humans are weird. That's why anybody who's been dating, you know, you meet those young couples who tell you, ah, so we've been dating for five years. I know everything about her. In fact, in Doha, they're like, ha, ha. 
who tell them they're going to have issues they look at you like hey pastor you have such issues eh us guys we're so different <laughs> let me tell you something there's something that happens when you say i do and you relax in the relationship that some somehow you just become yourself <laughs> and that yourself is not everything that you are before the real you comes out and at that point then the person has to deal with the real you and that's why we say in marriage it doesn't matter how long you try out a relationship it won't happen you actually just need to say they say marriage is a fast uh, course or the first degree where you do the you get the certificate first and then you do the exams later because <laughs> you have to choose to trust you say i'm going to give you my life i know that you might trample on my life you might destroy my life you might make me miserable you might i know all those things are very possible in fact they are likely but i choose to give you my life and when we face those challenges we will walk through them that's what you're really saying when we face the inevitable challenges we will walk through together because we are committed that's why you get married it's not feelings if you're getting married for feelings i have news for you <laughs> i have news for you <laughs> yeah you need to understand you know you call your spouse angel they're not an angel angels don't get married Angels don't get married and they live in heaven. Your spouse is a sinner. Capital S. The sooner you get to the sooner the, by the way all the married guys are laughing. Those ones of aha. Uh-huh. All the single guys are like this is so hilarious. <laughs> no, marriage is a risk. You choose to trust the person even though you're giving them power over you at that point. Yeah, that's what it is. That's the same thing with sunset. Let me tell there's a story. I don't know if you've heard the story about the traveler who was going to to a village. There were two travelers going to a village and one traveler found an old man outside the village, the first one, and he asked the village, the old man, "How are the people in this village?" And the old man told him, asked him, "How are the people in the village that you are you're moving from?" And the guy said, "Oh my god, they are good. They are trusting. They help each other. They are such warm people. I love my people." And the old man told him, "Uh the ones you're meeting are going to be exactly like that." And then a little while later the other one comes and he's asked so how, how he asked the old man the same question how are the people in this village and the guy tells him how are the people in the village you're moving from and the guy says ah yeah 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 they are sm- those guys are kenyans they are horrible <laughs> they are in your business they are thugs they are they are merciless i don't like them they gossip and the man looked at him and told him the ones you're going to are going to be exactly the same what was the man telling him it is you who is going to bring those issues in our village whatever attitude you're going to come into this thing with is what you're going to get out of it if you choose to trust you will gain trust if you choose to come in with suspicion you will gain suspicion i remember one one woman who told me i know i know i know i know that this man is going to cheat on me and he's going to divorce me i know she's married by the way the guy has never done anything like that but she's like i'm waiting for the day <laughs> by, by the way I'm, this, I'm i'm helping your neighbor right now don't don't uh... my wife can testify all my stories are true and this woman kept saying uh uh-uh. uh it's just that he hasn't shown his true colors this guy will have he will have an affair and he's going to leave me so guess what happened when he had an affair and he left her i knew it i knew it yeah But where was the problem? It was her. She prophesied that thing and prophesied it until it happened in her marriage. Yeah. So it's the same thing with this spiritual sonship conversation. If you in your heart are full of suspicion, if you believe you'll be taken advantage of, if you believe no one can be trusted, if you believe that you will be hurt, if you don't learn trust, you will never find it. Yeah? So accept The first thing you want to do allow them to speak into your life choose to trust number 2 spend time with them spend time with them this is a very interesting thing when you choose to if you don't know if you've never had a good father it's very hard to spend time you don't even know how to spend time with a father but spending time is such a good thing for you you understand that this person has something for you and you just choose to spend time and make your, just spend time and become easy in the relationship 
Elisha was like that with Elijah. He's like, dude, I'm with you. <laughs> Where are you going? Uh-huh. You're going to die. Sour, twende. <laughs> I'm with you. There's no way. You're not leaving me. Let's go. You're going where? I'll take you. He went with him. Even when other people tried to discourage him, he was committed to staying close to his leader. He knew his leader's anointing and he wanted the double portion. So when your leader calls a meeting, show up. Show up for it. And be there early. Be on time. Prioritize it. <laughs> you know, there's a, recently, I want to commend, Pastor, Papa Kilo did a, an overnight gathering. Hey. What? By the way, like, if you think this is crazy, they started at, what time did you guys start? Seven. Seven o'clock at night. And finished what time? Five thirty. Five thirty in the morning. Like, he was just teaching the whole night. And it was raining. Yes. And the hall was full. Yes. And it was raining cats and dogs outside. Yes. First of all, I just want to commend all you powerful people who showed up and spent a whole <laughs> night, a whole night, receiving impartation. I mean, to me, those are people who are ready. That's receiving. That's receiving. I mean, and the, the crazy thing, here's the crazy thing. It wasn't just people from downtown. Yeah. There was a whole contingent from Mashariki. Yeah. There was a contingent from South. Yeah. There was a contingent from Lifeway. Yeah. I mean, the, the building was full. Yeah. It was full. Nobody was being paid. Nobody was being coerced. The leaders just told them, I'm going to be teaching a whole night. And they showed up. Praise God. Yeah, receive them. Spend time with your leaders. Hang out with them. You know, go with them. Travel with them. Yeah. This, this one's traveled to Uganda with uh, Pastor Kilonzi, the, the downtown team. I love it. Yeah, he was. And by the way, there's something powerful that happens when you travel with your leader. Something powerful happens when you travel with your leader. Yeah. You, you get to see them as a human being. You get to see parts of them that, and there's just an impartation. It's a different level of impartation. I know that every time I traveled with Pastor Oscar back in the day, something changed in my life. Not even him blessing me. Just that proximity, I would see things. I would even see how people received him, and I'd be like, oh my God, that's, how, that's who this person is. <laughs> yeah, that's who this person, I didn't know who this, they somehow, you know how the Bible says a prophet is never received in his own hometown? You need to actually go with your pastor somewhere to see how the, the people receive your pastor. And you'll be like, oh, okay, sour. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah? So, so it's such a powerful thing. Spend time with them. There's no shortcut to proximity. Number three, listen to them. Listen to them. Yeah. By the way, another thing that used to happen is that here, pastor explain who we are to strangers. It was so powerful for me. I'm like, oh, that's who we are. Because you know, somehow in your home, you don't quite share it the same way. There are things I tell you guys that I assume, but when a stranger asks me and you listen to me, you'll be like, Pastor M, how come you've never told us that? Every time these guys go with me, that's what they tell me. How come you've never told us that? Yeah? I remember being with pastors somewhere and preaching, or was I preaching or praying? And pastors came and said, how come you've never prayed for us in Mavuna like that? Yeah. I told her, they don't receive me the same way. That's why. <laughs> It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> Number three, listen to them. Listen to them. Jesus says to his disciples, the words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Spirit and life. He's like, these are not just words. These words bear in them the impartation that you're looking for. His words carried anointing. When these people listened to Jesus, they didn't just listen. They soaked in his words. They
crazy. Yeah. She's like, she's my wife, but she's like, there's an impartation in this house and it's not passing me by. She's listening and receiving it. And there's something that God has revealed to her that has allowed her as a wife to do this. Because she's the one person who would have an excuse and say, but I'm his wife. In fact, I'm even there when he's creating the message. <laughs> we even went to college at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And listen, you may not have the same access as somebody else. Maybe you'd like to have access to your leader, but you don't have that physical access. And that's why the power of the word is important. Because you can listen. You can catch the spirit by just listening to their messages. You can begin to soak in and understand. By the way, I remember I, there's one Mavunai who told me, Pastor M, nowadays, even before you speak, I have a feeling where you're going. He says, I've listened to all your messages. And I've, I think I have a feeling of what you're desiring for Mavuna Church. Like she's gone beyond just listening to the place of, I can see the theme. I can see where you're leading us to. She's caught something of the spirit of the, of, of the ministry. So I have a whole podcast for that reason, by the way. I put it there for you. It's got about a lot of followers, but it's got about 50 people who listen to the sermons faithfully. <laughs> I can tell you that because the statistics tell me there are 50 of you who listen to those messages. They're not for the 50, they're for all of us. Just listen to them. You know, it can sound like I'm trying to sell my podcast. I don't make money from the podcast. I don't intend to. But I, I understand that there are certain things that pass on. There's, certain revela there's a way revelation comes when you re-listen to a message. Right now we're reading the, the New Testament, isn't it? And uh, it's probably my 20th, <laughs> if not 30th time to read it. But it's interesting. Even now there's words that I'm rece receiving and I'm like, oh my gosh, I never saw this. Oh, that's what this meant. And so listen to it because this is one of the ways, this is one of the steps to the anointing. Number three, number four, my last two. Serve them. Serve them. I talked about the, the place of servanthood when it comes to catching anointing. You know, it's very interesting because uh, when, when, we, when, we, when we, the, there's a scripture we read about the man who poured hands, water on Elijah's hands. This was a brand that Elisha was known for. You know, it implies he served him in a humble way. He met his needs and that was what he was known for. I remember once meeting an Australian church planter back in the day. He was leading a movement of churches before I even knew what a movement was. I, re I was recalling this conversation the other day because at the time when he told us this story, I was still a pastor at Nairobi Chapel. And that story just flew past. It entered one ear and came out the other. I didn't understand what he was talking about. Now, at least I, I, my memory brought that story back. I was like, oh my God. I wish I understood then. Because it's like I'm catching now what he was telling us 20 years ago. And the guy told, he said, you know, because we asked him, how do you mentor people? When people come and say, I want you to mentor me, how do you mentor the people around you? You must have so many. Because he had many, many churches. He has started a movement of churches. And this Australian guy said, you know one of the things I do? All these young men who are coming to ask me to mentor them, I get them to come and cut my grass. And he says, I, I, get, I basically get them to serve me. They do my errands, they drive my car, they pick my kids from school, they do the things I need. So I remember us pastors were like, dude, it's like child abuse. It's like, <laughs> like people are coming for ministry and then you're sending them to do things for you. And I remember asking, so how does that help them? And he, you know what he said? He said, you know what? I'm, I'm not giving them a job. I'm giving them proximity. I'm giving them access. Amen. Yeah, when you're in my house cutting my grass, he's like, we have access. I'll come out to see how the grass is doing. I'll come out with a glass of juice. And as we drink the juice, we'll have a chat. You'll also have access to watching my life. You will see the simple way in which I live. You will actually see whether the things I'm teaching in church are the same things that are happening in my home. You will see how I talk to my wife. You see how my children relate. Because you know there are some things you can't fake. The kids can't act. At you now they're visitors. Oh, daddy. And before they're like, oh, daddy. You know, it's like they'll continue being themselves. And so when you have proximity, you have access, you learn things even before, even more than what I teach you. Because some people think mentorship is we sit down and have coffee and then you pour into me. <laughs> no. So serve. Find ways to serve your spiritual leader. That's what I'm trying to say. Find ways. Volunteer. If you know that they're starting something, they're passionate about something, volunteer to do it. Volunteer to do it. By the way, it's so amazing. Carry their bag. Find their need and meet it. <laughs> Find their need and meet it. Help them paint their house. If, they are, if, you, if you are a painter and they are painting. Yeah. Plant their garden. I don't know. Just figure out what they need and find a way to do it. 
find a way to do it. So let me let me put one of my deacons on the spot, Victoria. Paul, I know, I know, I know, I don't like putting you on the spot, but I have to. This lady, I didn't know her name. I could not recognize her from Adam. You know, like a few a few months ago, I had no clue. I had no clue who this person was. Is that true? Yeah, she used to be here with Kina Pastor James. I just used to see her. Today she's a friend. She's on my, like I'm on her phone, she's on my phone. Wow. When she has issues, she talks to her pastor, then she calls me and says, by the way, I talked to Pastor James, can you also pray for me? <laughs> not many people have that access, by the way. Yeah, not you know you have it. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. But you know what she did? She discovered I had a need. I won't tell you what the need was. <laughs> she called me and said, Pastor M, I have your solution. And she solved my need and said, which other need do you have? And she solved that need also. And I'm not saying this, by the way, in any way to embarrass you, but I'm saying we've had conversations that I wouldn't have with somebody who joined Mavuno when you joined. Mm. I've had conversations with, I know about your family. Yes. I know about your mother who prays. Oh, yes. I know about your family members. Yes. I know how you are supporting your friend who passed away the other day. Yes. We prayed many times for her. Yes. Imagine. Because I'm here, I don't come to Hill City. I'm so far from Hill City. But we have a relationship. Yes, we do. I, I'm just using you to demonstrate my point here. Yeah. But I'm so grateful for our friendship. Thank you, Thank you for serving me. Yeah. Yeah. My wife knows her. She has sat in our house. She has had tea. Uh, hey. <laughs> and when did we meet? This year. There are people who, who we've said high five for the last five years. You don't even know where I live. <laughs> Yeah. Let, let me say this. Your pastor is always there for you when you're in trouble. Yeah. If something happens today and there's a funeral, in your, you know you'll call your church and your church will show up for you. Your pastor always shows up for you. But you know, it's almost like sometimes you feel like you're, sometimes a pastor can become like a vendor, a supplier. You know those suppliers in weddings? There's the flower people, the caterer, the, sh the band, and the pastor. Mm? You're just here to preach and go home. That's not their role. They care for your soul. How do you care back for them? And one of the ways you get proximity and access is by serving. So serve your pastors, by the way. It's interesting. I was with uh, one of the guys who, this, this man here playing keyboard, he's such an amazing guy. He's, he has served me in incredible ways. I mean, when my dad died, he was there. When my sister died, he was there. When my uncle died, in Rongai. He left his house in Siokimau and came all the way to Rongai and stayed with us the whole of that first day. Uh, just, he was just like, whatever you tell me. In fact, I told him, man, he just stop, I'm coming. And he did. Very interesting. Amazing man. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I'm not talking about my immediate disciples because these ones, I assume these things on them. They do these things for us all the time. Another person that was interesting is Persis. Pastor Persis here. When did you come from Uganda? Three years ago. My God. Like, passes right now, she even knows where we keep our key in the house. <laughs> it's true. She knows which even, she even knows when we haven't shopped. And she knows where when we shop, I hide the things that I don't want everybody to know where they are. <laughs> but I can tell you, there's nothing we've done as a family where she hasn't come like, your daughter's getting married. Let me take her shopping. What do you do? Like, she just serves us. Now, you may not all be able to serve us, but we are many leaders in Mavuno Church. You can have access, you have access to, you can create access through serving your leader. And by the way, some of these things I'm teaching are not just church things. You can even apply them in, in your workplace. You will be amazed at what they do for you and the access they give to you. Just learning to serve. Last one, last one, last one. I want to conclude. You guys are looking hungry now and not for spiritual things. <laughs> Honor them. Number five, honor them. Another way to receive your spiritual parent is through honoring them. Honor them with your words. Honor them with your attitude towards them. Honor them when they are not there in how you speak about them, in how you, you, you represent uh, to them. When you hear people talking about them a certain way, you need to be able to be proud in how you represent them. You know, it's very interesting. Um, <laughs> one of our journalists, um, who's a good man, uh, wrote something really disparaging about our airport the other day. <laughs> hey, it was so bad. I mean, it was so bad 
And then what happened when he wrote it? All the Kenyans jumped on to say, yes, what kind of Kenya is this? What kind of government? Nye, 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 nye. You know, so much nyef nyef. And it's like everybody's just throwing it on that. To the place where one British journalist, famous guy, when he was asked about the worst airports in the world, he said, yeah, of course everybody knows Jomo Kenyatta is the worst airport. I'm like, are you mad? I've traveled around the world. No, Jomo Kenyatta is not the worst airport in the world. Not by far. It's not. But you know, because of the people of the house, connecting and just talking rubbish about the house. By the way, even when this journalist said that, there's some Kenyans who are like, yes, you see, we knew. Even the English people are saying the same thing about us. They did tell us about them to travel. <laughs> of course, of course those ones are... Of course, those ones are not shared when English stadiums are full of leaks and holes. Nobody, nobody makes news stories about them. But you know what I'm trying to say is when we dishonor our leaders, we dishonor ourselves. Yeah. You may think that you're... for the blessings that they pour into your life is by ministering to them. Don't do it because they need it. In fact, I'll be honest with you. Many Mavuno pastors, because me, I know my, my pastors, many of them will be awkward about it. They're awkward about it. They'll never ask you. They'll never tell you they have need. That's because they're people of integrity. They understand they don't want to take advantage of their position. So they won't come and tell you, oh, by the way, we're really struggling to pay rent this month. They won't tell you stuff like that. Because they understand they have power and they don't want to misuse their power. So don't do it because they have a need. You know, it's interesting because one of the things I've come to understand, for me, when somebody is a blessing to me, I honor them. I, 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 when, when I understood this, it became such a powerful thing. I actually honor them with my substance. Not with Mavuno's substance, with my substance. I honor them with my substance. You know, you'll never, re you'll never receive an anointing that you despise. You'll never receive it. Yeah. You'll never receive an anointing that you don't honor. There's something about honor that is like a switch. It's like a switch to a current. Um, you connect, you, you can connect your toaster, your phone to charge, 
but until you turn on the switch it's just sitting there there's something you t- you do when you turn on and it's just like all of a sudden there's a connection that flows and i i see honor that way it's almost like that switch i turn on i'm already connected to the current and then somehow it just comes on it switches on the current and it's interesting because honor is not worship i i like to say that i think i think for us in this day we need to know that by honoring somebody i'm not worshiping them may we never be idol idolaters that cults are idol i i i idolatry places that place a person before god may that never be who we are as a church uh this church is about jesus and it will always be about jesus we have to lift jesus higher it's never about a person part of the reason why i teach this is because i believe there's a culture god wants to establish in this church it's a most awkward thing for me to teach because some people hear this and think pastor i want us to give him money that's why i'm happy i don't pastor any church that any of you are part of ha <laughs> yeah i because i'm not there on sunday you don't see me on sunday so when i'm teaching this i'm teaching what you're going to do to your pastor yeah i can teach you because they're not going to teach you this i will teach it to you you need to honor them and honor them with substance be a blessing to them ka alabasta jar with expensive oil the first thing judas said is this thing could have fed the poor is that people in ministry are like why this christian i mean you could have given poor the poor your money why are you blessing your pastor but jesus says leave her alone her name will be remembered for all eternity yeah her name will be remembered that's what he said she will be remembered here's the thing i believe when you pour oil on your shepherd your name will be remembered your ministry will be remembered long after you're gone i want to conclude we're going to take a lunch break we're going to come back to one for one more session uh today i'm laying the foundation tomorrow we'll get a chance to even ask questions maybe and and hopefully give some testimonies as well if you already have a testimony tell us i'd love to hear any testimony of things that god has done even as we were teaching you can tell pastor godwin over the lunch break uh maybe we'll give a chance for some of those to be shared before we start the last session we'll do one session then we'll come back tomorrow uh my prayer is we'll have a chance to dig deep into the anointing this weekend and then we're going to have a chance just to pray and trust god i really believe that god is going to use his authority and power in different ways for different people for the season that god is calling you into because i believe that some of you god is calling you into a very new season in your leadership uh and in the role that he's calling you into so we're going to have a time to do that i want you to as pastor godwin is coming up maybe just reflect on those five the things that we talked about the the steps to the anointing vessel change what was the second one servanthood sonship spiritual impartation time and season just maybe reflect for a minute which of those is the hardest for you personally and maybe think about in your particular situation right now uh which is the one you would struggle with the most where where are you feeling there's a disconnect for you uh which one which and which one resonates also maybe this is just more of an introspection question